So let's talk about the uh, budget. This was the spring budget this week. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's last chance to turn things around for the Conservative Party. And what did we get? We got uh, essentially the only headline measure really was this 2p cut in national insurance, precisely the same measure um, as they gave us in the autumn statement. I mean, Luke, at, at this stage, do you think the Tories just have a death wish? I mean, they don't seem to even be trying to win anyone over. Well, all the reporting suggests they've given up and are coasting towards what they know is going to be an electoral defeat. That might be some reason why the budget was so underwhelming. He did, of course, take some of the wind out of Labour sales by abolishing the non-DOM status, which was a key Labour policy. And pays for all of their policies. Exactly like right. So breakfast clubs to toothbrushing classes. And exactly. So you think maybe there is uh, some politic, some real politic going on there. Um I think it's worth remembering that uh, the, the uh, worth noting the absence of lockdown in the discussion of our economy. Mm. Um, all of the measures introduced by Jeremy Hunt were uh, necessary or explicable by reference to the lockdown. So, tax obviously personal tax went up during the course of the lockdown. Our, our tax spend, our tax intake went down, and then so now we are facing the consequences of having very high tax that he's now able to to knock some off. Uh, his famous, his his vaunted uh, public sector productivity plan. He was on the radio this morning explaining that the the need for this plan was because productivity went down in the course of the lockdown. Yeah. So, you know, this is uh, uh, we are still living in, and of course, the lockdown was the greatest economic intervention uh, in ever, arguably, or in, at least in m many decades. So, yeah. uh, the fact that there is just no discussion of that on of the ongoing impact there, I think, is worth noting. Uh, and then it's worth uh, pointing out that really this is, as, as you suggest, kind of rearranging um, chairs on the on, on the deck of the Titanic. It's obviously, I mean, it's almost trite to say that there aren't any big economic ideas here. We, we almost don't expect any big economic yeah. ideas from budgetary announcements at this stage, particularly not from Jeremy Hunt, and particularly when I think they are anticipating an electoral defeat sometime uh, relatively soon. Um, but the, you know the, the 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 true scale of the uh, of of the lack of ambition here is is quite is quite staggering. I mean, even this morning, Jeremy Hunt is now saying that the cut in um, national insurance will be funded by an increase in income tax. <laughs> so it's literally yeah. <laughs> just moving two numbers around. Yeah. Um, and of course, it does nothing to reckon with the colossal economic problems that most households are facing. You know, uh, we could talk about the uh, the impact of the mortgage crisis brought on by uh, the, the the markets in the aftermath of Liz Truss's um, uh, unfunded uh, uh, budgetary commitments. Uh, but households are struggling immensely. And uh, the idea that um, uh, this is going to do anything to fix that uh, is for the birds, I think. And just worth also mem mentioning another impact of the lockdown is worklessness yeah. and unemployment. So we have a unbelievably high, you know, one over a million people out of work. Um, and I don't even think anyone can explain how um, the cut in national insurance will get people back into work. Yeah, I can't, that, that was the purported explanation that we need to fix part of this worklessness problem. Um, and we'll do that by cutting national insurance. But I can't quite, I don't quite yeah. get the rationale. I, I've not seen anyone sensibly explain how that will happen. It, it gives you a tiny bit more on your pay packet, but actually when you see a job advertised, you don't, you see it pre-tax. Exactly. So it doesn't make any, yeah. any exactly. sense as an incentive. Yeah, Luke, I mean, you mentioned the, you know, the lockdown being the most significant economic intervention of our lifetimes. I think that's true. I think, you know, it is interesting how it doesn't figure in the discussion. People are prepared to, uh, essentially if the technocratic kind of elites agree with something, then you almost can't talk about it. So they supported the lockdown, so it doesn't feature, even though it caused the biggest, actually the biggest drop in GDP in the history of modern capitalism. Mm. The last time we saw uh, numbers fall that much was the Great Frost, <laughs> when the entire Thames fell over and all everyone's crops died. So it's really, you know, that was that was in like the 1700s. Uh, hugely significant event that is now sort of airbrushed from national life. We don't talk about net zero and how that has pushed up energy bills. We can talk about, you know, they're comfortable talking about the war in Ukraine and global gas prices, but the underlying thing is that since the Climate Change Act of 2005, uh, energy prices for industry in particular has just gone up and up and up and up. You know, terrible constraint on our economy that we're just not allowed to talk about because, or it's not really talk part of the discussion because the experts or the elites kind of agree with it. Um, I mean, Candice, you know, one of the things that struck me is that, you know, Luke mentioned we talked about the scale of the problems uh, versus the paucity of the of the solution. It's not just the, the scale of the economic problems, but the scale of the Tory party's problems. Even that couldn't shake them into 
doing something, pulling anything out of the hat. No, and you won't expect anything from Labour either. They yeah. haven't got any sort of ideas either or any bold radical vision for the future. I do wonder if this sort of timidity comes from what happened with Truss and Quateng's budget. Mm. And now they are very afraid of going against the orthodoxy in any way or displeasing the markets in, in any way. I mean, you saw this with um, Jeremy Hunt being very um, cognizant of what the OBR was predicting. Yeah, even the, though the he, Office for Budget Responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is what's happened now. This The OBR is supposedly constrains what politicians can do and he doesn't want to be seen to go against them in any way because I mean trusted that and look what she did you know mm. what I mean she just she crashed the economy um so you will see a lot more of that I mean I don't know what Labour would propose to do um in distinction to what the Tories have proposed to do I don't think they have any better ideas either and I think that people who think that they're going to represent change it's just not going to happen you're going to get the exact same cautious response little bits of tinkering here and there but not much else well, actually, I mean, yeah, it could. I mean, it could get worse if if people think that you know the OBR forecasts are what's constraining growth, what's constraining, you know, what the Chancellor can do. Um, I mean, they are often wrong. I think that's an important thing to point out. <laughs> um, I think across the past ten years, they've been wrong by an average of about fifteen percent, which is the equivalent of two uh, times the NHS budget could pay for about four uh, HS twos. The amount of just them getting it wrong, and and yet those are you know that's what we base our public spending on. Um, but Labour will be worse because Labour wants to enshrine the OBR's uh, role into law to say the OBR must approve of our budgets. Yeah. So where do we go from here? Well, it's 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 just worth remembering that forecasting. Uh, it, this isn't a problem with the OBR itself or yeah. necessarily the OBR as individuals. It's a problem with forecasting, and forecasting is inherently difficult and often gets things very very wrong and when it comes to the economy those problems are compounded because it's dependent on so it's dependent on so many different factors so it is mad when we talk about things like fiscal headroom mm. I and mean, i didn't know what fiscal headroom was until i looked it up and it's the the amount that effectively that the obr decides that we've got to play with based on their own forecasts yeah but making decisions on that on that basis is mad because those forecasts are so vulnerable to change and yeah. it doesn't permit long-term thinking it doesn't allow for you know, investment now for say um, that will yield in 10, 15, 20 years time. It just, it doesn't proceed on that basis. It proceeds more on a very narrow view of what is possible. And so until we completely change the way that um, governments make decisions about money, we're mm. going to be stuck in this very short termist approach. And you're, you're right that Labour have broadly taken the same approach. I think that's such an interesting point. And, and you look at a lot of the um net zero legislation as well, or the way that the, the government has sort of picked winners in electric vehicles, but ordinary people are rejecting it for very good reasons. They don't want electric vehicles. That's you know why there aren't good secondhand markets in it. And actually people are looking at other forms of um, energy, which are actually looking to be a lot better. And, and that's the problem when you sort of have this fixed approach and you don't allow for pragmatism and shifting and being able to respond to different things. And you're also distrustful of the choices of ordinary people. But, yeah. You know, they will make irrational choices. Yeah. They, so you have to make the choices for them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. And that, again, that problem is only set to get worse. Luke, I did just want to, before we move on, um, ask you about the Rochdale by-election. Um, before we before we went on air uh, last week, we didn't know the results, but it was a resounding victory for, for George Galloway. I mean, what have you made of that? What does that tell us about our politics? Tell us anything about le something that Labour should be worried about? I don't think it's something that Labour has to be too worried about. I don't think that the Workers' Party will be capable of picking up seats elsewhere in the country. I think George Galloway did a very good job of picking up on a single issue in a particular constituency, which was Gaza, uh, in, in, a, in a constituency with a, a heavy Muslim vote. Um, the turnout was actually quite good in Rochdale, so we can't. I, I don't think it's right that Labour, and I don't think Labour's explanation that George Galloway only won because they withdrew can be correct. Mm. I think it was obviously dynamics within that individual constituency around this particular issue um, that, that that won him the day. And I think you know broadly um, that, that 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 kind of victory will not be replicable elsewhere. I, I think that we we might want to pay notice to the to the issue of other parties in the context of the next election so not just the workers party but um reform who mm. um, are not performing as well as ukip yeah. did in the in, in the in the lead up to the last european elections where they did very well um but they are picking up votes and they could be relevant to 
taking chunks out of the conservative vote. Um, but in terms of George Galloway, I think he, he did a very good job in, in, in galvanising a particular section of the electorate in that constituency. But as to his, I mean, his political party is quite interesting. You know, the, 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 the Workers' Party are for the workers, not the Wokies. Yeah. So they have kind of pitched themselves as a anti-woke, pro-worker party. But they're headed by Chris Williamson, mm. who is an inherently... It's the deputy leader. Yeah. Deputy, sorry, deputy leader. And, you know, in terms of broader broader policies, I don't think they have any chance of making electoral uh, progress, but who knows? Yeah, I mean, he did try to turn uh, Rochdale into a referendum on Gaza, which I would say for the average worker is probably not the, the top <laughs> issue. I don't know if people saw the two letters that he wrote. It's you know, really alarming. Yeah, yeah. one you know, very clearly addressed to Muslim voters, to, you know, addressed in terms as members of the Ummah. Um, and then the other addressed to presumably non-Muslim white working class voters saying, make Rochdale great again. I know what a woman is. I'm not woke. Yeah. <laughs> That's, this is the line he tries to straddle, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I don't think, I think he's just a clever electoral politician. I also think he's a good, obviously a good orator. And I do think there is some merit to say that he is a politician in that, with, with some ideas. And I do think people are drawn to him because he speaks his mind and is openly anti-establishment, but his views on all sorts of issues are completely backward. Yeah. Starting with Gaza and then, and, and I think you're right to say that he is, he tries to be lots of different things to different people. Yeah, definitely. And do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, maybe we shouldn't read too much into it. You know, I've read a lot of pieces saying that this is the start of sectarian politics. But I mean, I've seen this pattern with George Galloway before. Yeah. And he's been elected in this way before. And, you know, maybe this time is different. I don't know. We'll have to see. I, I don't have a crystal ball. But I think what's happened with him in the past is he's been able to get himself elected on these sort of issues, these international issues, and really use them. But then as an MP, he's actually not that great and people become dissatisfied with him. Yeah. So, you know, you may see that play out again. Like I say, I don't know. Maybe this is a turning point and we are seeing the emergence of a whole new type of politics. Um, but from what I know of George Galloway, <laughs> you've seen this play out again and again yeah. and again and again. And, and also a bit rich of Labour to complain that someone else is doing the sectarian politics. That's meant to be, you know... That's meant to be their thing. <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't, uh, yeah, that's right. That. I think it's also worth pointing out how vile it is that George Galloway has come out so regularly and compared what's happening in Gaza to the Holocaust. Yeah. That's perhaps a bit too big of a discussion to get into now, but it's like he knows the buttons to push mm. um, in the most offensive kind of way. I mean, what happening? what is happening in Gaza is absolutely appalling and awful, but it's not the Holocaust. It's not comparable to the Holocaust, and I don't think it's comparable to a genocide. And I, But I think he knows that that is a way of driving that level of sectarianism. So I think I think Candice is right that we shouldn't uh, read too much into the sectarian impact of his um, election, but I do think he knows about sectarianism and he, he's unafraid to engage with it.